Hello, and welcome to the Cointelegraph Research Terminal. I'll be your host, Michael DeBone. I'm an economist with Cointelegraph Research. Joining me today is Smiat Balridi from Keychain Ventures, a crypto investment firm that engages in the investment of funds and other investment vehicles. From Dragonfly Capital to Sieb Korishi. Dragonfly is a global crypto investment firm that deals with many areas of the blockchain industry, including working with some of the most notable names and world-renowned private equity and venture capital investors. And venture capital has been a, has seen a dramatic rise in recent years, climbing from over 800 deals in 2020 at around 5 billion USD to over 1,300 deals in 2021, with capital inflows of over $30 billion. Smith, can you tell us a little bit about Keychain and what you look for in a fund before you attach the Keychain name to a firm? So when we, when we look for funds, we follow an institutional approach for fund selection and portfolio construction. We do have our own list of criteria that we follow from an investment and operational due diligence. However, at the core of it, we look for three things. One, funds that are set up to capture the opportunity in the blockchain space. Two is what we call blockchain native teams. And three is, is a repeatable, re repeatable track record. Um, and what would mean by the first one is basically we believe that investing in the blockchain requires its own approach and own playbook to, to capturing the, the, the best opportunities. And uh, you know, the, the funds that are set up for the blockchain space have usually different skill sets or um, uh, uh, tools uh, to, to, to capture these opportunities, such as being able to run nodes, design token economics or network incentives, uh, providing liquidity and helping launching some of these protocols, launching communities, et cetera. And that's, that's uh, for us um, quite important uh, to have, to be able to, to invest and capture the best opportunities in this space. Um, the second point about blockchain native teams is basically teams that are embedded into the ecosystem that uh, have uh, uh, you know, uh, an access or unique access to, the, to these opportunities and to these founders. And then lastly, is uh, repeatable track record. For us, it's quite important to, to see a clear repeatable investment process and strategy that will lead out, that will lead to outperformance in, 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 in the fund. So underpinning all of this, we, we run a very uh, rigorous investment and operation due diligence. Uh, we have our internal process and tools that enable us to conduct fund manager selection with an institutional quality level. And that's what we aim to bring to our investors. You know, anybody can write a white paper, uh, put some numbers together and make it look like there's some, some there there. Um, Hasib, can you tell us a little bit about Dragonfly and what do you look for in a project before investing? What we look for when we're underwriting an investment. Um, so generally, there are a few different kinds of investments that require different kinds of underwriting. So, um, you know, I'll, first I'll just start with seed stage investments because I think they're the, the easiest to kind of wrap your head around. Um, usually when you're investing in the seed stage, uh, there are three general uh, factors that almost every investor is going to look for. And different investors value different ones of these factors differently depending on what kind of investor they are. So the three factors are team, product, and market. And depending on what kind of investor you are, you tend to, you tend to really focus on one particular part of this. So some investors are like, look, I really care about market. I love NFT infrastructure. If I see a good deal in NFT infrastructure, I'm going to go for it because I think it's going to be a huge market. Uh, some people are like, look, it's all about product. I just want to see a beautifully designed front end. I want to see an amazing experience. And if I see that, I'm going to invest. And that's what drives me as an investor. Um, and then there are people who are driven by team. Like, look, I just want to bet on smart people. And even if the product isn't really there yet, or if the market is a little unstructured or hasn't been proven, that's fine. I just, I think people are going to figure it out. And it's ultimately about people. So different investors sit on a different place in this, in this kind of triangle. Um, and I'd say for Dragonfly, or at least for me personally, um, I tend to skew much more team in the early stage. Where, you know, historically what I can tell you is that a lot of the founders that we have backed 
initially, they didn't really have a clear idea of what the market was going to be, or the market didn't even exist yet. Um, you know, DeFi is a perfect example of that, is that in the early days of DeFi, it was all betting on founders because there was no market, there was no traction. Like DeFi, had, the term DeFi hadn't even been coined in 2019 when we started investing into DeFi. Um, DeFi was a marketing term that was invented by Dharma, um, which it came a good while after the market really congealed and became really tangible as a, as a real meaningful thing. And so back then, um, and the products, of course, were all terrible or, you know, most of them were pre-launch and the UIs were all garbage. The UX was really bad. Um, and so the only thing you could really bet on back then was people. And um, and this this has really informed a lot of my view about how investing in early stage has to go, is it has to be about investing in people. Um, but as you look later and later stage when you start looking at a Series A investment, a Series B investment, or a treasury sale, and you're getting later in in the life cycle, whether it be a company or a protocol, that's when you start skewing more towards market being more important, and then more towards product being more important. And that's when it's less about the the team, the founder, the vision doing the talking, and it's more about the metrics, the traction, you know, sort of show show me the goods, show me that this thing is actually working and has a path to scaling. Um, And so that's general high-level framework of how we think about underwriting investments. Smeet, is there something that you wish you knew when you started investing in funds that you know now? Would it, you know, that you can go back in time, let's say, you know, what could you tell yourself, you know, a couple of years ago um, before you started throwing money at different funds? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, hindsight is, is always twenty twenty, but um you know, the space is, is very nascent, and I think what we've seen is um, teams and fund manager um, set up themselves differently and, um, and uh, you know, adapt to different, uh, di- you know, different changes in, the, in, the, in this space uh, in different ways. And, um, you know, for us, I think definitely uh, the, the changing nature of this space with all these new, new use cases that are being developed continuously, like, you know, DeFi was the use case for 2020, NFTs were the use case of 2021, and I'm sure potentially DAOs and scalability might be the use cases for 2022 going forward. And, uh, and, and that's, and that's uh, you know, what, is, what is, uh, makes this, this space challenging from an investment, investment perspective. And that's why for us, focusing on that repeatable track record is, is quite important. And uh, if you go back two years ago, uh, you know, the space was pretty nascent from a funding manager perspective. Most of them were around three, four years old. Today, obviously, you have more hindsight and you have more, more track record to be able to judge on the performance. Hasib, what are some of the ways an up-and-coming project can start garnering the interest of Dragonfly and firms like yours, and what should they have ready? Uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no formula for... Uh, sort of garnering interest from investors. Um, Like what ultimately gets us excited is innovation. If you have a new idea, a new approach, a new insight, um, it doesn't have to be necessarily fully fleshed out within a protocol or a company. Um, But the the germ of something investable is you realize something that other people don't realize. Um, And it doesn't have to be something that no one's ever tried before. Actually, almost everything in crypto that's worked was tried before, right? Like Ethereum, even before Ethereum, there was MasterCoin, which, which tried to you know, enhance the the, um, the computability on top of Bitcoin. Uh, but Ethereum was the one that got it right. And, you know, in DeFi, like before there was Compound and Aave, there was, we talked really about Dharma, right? Dharma was the first uh, lending protocol in Ethereum. Before there was Uniswap, there was uh, Ether, there was uh, Ether Delta. And so it's not about being first. It's not about being the first person to even have an idea, right? Even before Uniswap, there was Bancor, which was actually an AMM. Um, but the insight, the thing that you realize that other people don't realize, that is the most important thing. That if I am, you know, if, even if looking at a, a, a seed round, um, if I'm talking to an entrepreneur and I, and I don't see that they know something that the market doesn't know, they don't have some secret or some insight or some, some, earned, um, some earned knowledge about why this domain that they want to build something in is crackable, uh, that's the biggest impediment toward, toward getting the first round of funding. Absolutely. And it's very important. And uh, Smeet mentioned um, that, you know, DeFi, you know, 2020 had its own trend. 2021 had its own trend, it seems, with NFTs. We had DeFi, the DeFi summer, um, you know, Solana summer, perhaps 2021. And, you know, Smith, as we go forward into 2022, do you see any other long term, perhaps, uh, trends that, you know, are going to be picking up this year or 
uh, anything like that going on in your, it, that you guys see? Well, I, I think um, the way I see it, I think scalability is going to be a big, uh, big theme for uh, 2022. Scalability solutions through rollups or bridges and, and other things that will create more interoperability between all these different layer ones. Uh, and I think DAOs, DAOs have already had a, a good run uh, in 20, at the end of 2021 and I think they will continue and there will be different um, you know, shapes and forms and, and use cases around DAOs and, 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 and toolings around DAOs that is quite important uh, to enable all of that. Totally agreed. Um, Hasib, do you see anything? Uh, I, yeah, I see a lot. I mean, I think uh, we're, we're going to see Layer 2s finally come to life and ideally in a more fully fledged way than they are right now. Um, I think we're, we're still waiting to see what call it, generation two of crypto gaming is going to look like right now. I think we're still very firmly in gen one of this kind of, you know, we, I mean, we just saw the largest hack in, uh, DeFi history happen basically yesterday with, uh, Axie Infinity. Um, and I think this, this might be, uh, the beginning of the end for that, you know, very original vision of what play to earn gaming was going to look like. Um, and I think we're, we're now starting to see. Um, some of the entrepreneurs, who are, more and more of the entrepreneurs who are coming into the space, um, especially on the gaming side, have a very different vision of how gaming is going to work within crypto. And so I think that that's probably going to come to fruition over the next couple of years. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of advancement in zero knowledge and cryptography. Uh, and I think that it, 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 it's always too early to know how quickly this stuff is going to be usable, is going to come to market in a way that can actually be relied upon for robust security. Um, I think the other thing I would say is that it's probably going to be the year uh, for interoperability and really robust interoperability. Um, and also the, the year where we start to realize that like multi-sig security is bullshit. And, you know, we, we, we can kind of ignore it for a long time. Obviously, the, the hack that happened yesterday was precisely that. It was a multi-sig. And the, we can ignore it for a long time as long as hacks don't happen. And once the hacks start rolling in and you start to see... The things that, you know, the, the technologists for a long time have been warning about, like, hey, you guys are, you guys are right now, you know, you're building on top of a foundation of sand. And eventually you will pay the price for the insecurity that's undergirding a lot of the blockchains that, are, that exist today, right? Like, why, why do people tell you you should trust a roll-up and not a sidechain? This is one of the answers, right? The sidechain is secured by a multi-sig of nine people. And a, a roll-up has the security of the underlying blockchain, which has never, you know, Ethereum has never seriously failed in the basically seven years since it's existed. And um, I think that is going to become more and more important part of the story uh, over the next year or two. Out of all of the, um, all of the sources for funding, the, still the top number one source is, is funds across the entire world. And num the number one is the United States. But coming up the ranks to number six now for last year was DAOs. And DAOs are increasingly becoming a um, source of funding and they're their own funds within themselves. Does Keychain um, work with DAOs and is there a particular complexity that, that exists when working with DAO? Because it's not like you can contact one person or just one person um, necessarily have to deal with just them. You're dealing with proposals and votes and everything else. Um, does Keychain uh, work with DAOs or, does look, or potentially work with DAOs in the future, especially as they become a a huge um, source of funding uh, potentially in 2022 and beyond? So, I mean, for, for, for us, we're an institutional investor and what we provide to our investors is a, an institutional grade platform for, for, for uh, uh, fund uh, manager access and, and selection. Uh, so unfortunately, DAOs will not fit our criteria of, uh, for, for the investment or operational due diligence. Um, there is no, I mean, the, the legal stru structures around them are still um, to be formed or still unclear, and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's difficult for us at the moment to engage with them. But definitely, we believe in the future as as the DAO's structures evolve, uh, it it could actually become an interesting um, an interesting, an interesting um, uh, access or an interesting uh, 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 way of accessing the blockchain space through DAOs. Excellent. Um, Hasib, as far as a philosophy of an investment um, for your firms, do you look for projects that just fit one sector of the market? I know you mentioned before that you like to be involved with everything. Um, 
you know, but is there more, you know, so you like to have diversity across all the areas of the crypto verse. Um, but is there, you know, more, are you guys tilted more towards some things or is it just a splattering of a little bit of everything? <laughs> I'd say we're we're pretty agnostic. Like, I mean, I think a large part of being a crypto investor is being open to having your mind changed as crypto evolves underneath you, right? Like, if you if you came in in 2017 and you were just like, okay, I'm going to invest in the things that I like and this is going to be my investment mandate, you would just be absolutely screwed because almost nothing that people were investing in 2017 is what they're investing in today, right? Except maybe you know, new layer ones is like the only thing in common in the thread. Um, you would have missed all of DeFi, you would have missed all of NFTs, you would have missed all of gaming, you would have bet, you know, half the farm into security tokens and into, you know, random weird blockchain for uh, supply chain provenance or whatever. Like that, that was what people were investing in in 2017. And the, um, the reality is that, you know, the way that I view it, your job as a crypto investor is to shut up and learn and to, to pay attention and change your mind faster than the market is, is learning and changing its mind. Um, and so... That's one of the reasons why, I mean, you know, th there's, a, there's a meme going around about how uh, Paradigm, which is one of the leading funds in crypto, keeps hiring high schoolers. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, and, and, and we've hired very young people as well. It's, it's actually kind of one of the hallmarks of the industry is the fact that so many of the folks who are really successful in crypto are extremely young. And why is that? You know, when, in, in a lot of traditional firms, when you look for um, you know, prodigious GPs or investors. Very often you're looking for graybeards who've been doing it for 20 years, who have, you know, the wealth of experience. That's not what the greatest investors in crypto look like. The greatest investors in crypto um, have, the, the, the thing that you value most is suppleness of mind, speed of learning, uh, willingness to, to kind of go down and get your hands dirty and, and deal with the actual protocols and the DAOs and the governance and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and generally speaking, the people who are most capable and also closest to the metal of how this innovation is happening are the people who are coming straight out of college and have been living and breathing and eating this stuff since, you know, they were in high school. One more topic I wanted to bring up I thought was very interesting. So out of the top 10 investors last year, um, firms and individuals, um, it seems like nine of them focused mostly on DeFi. DeFi was the biggest thing that they focused on. The least focused on was CeFi. And the only two people that really vote, uh, did those two things was uh, Coinbase Ventures and um, Almeida Research, which are dealing with exchanges on their own. Um, and then everything else is broken up between NFTs, infrastructure, and Web3. Do you guys... I, I kind of think that that pattern is going to continue and DeFi is going to also be you know heavily invested in. Do you guys see that same type of, uh, do you guys think it'll change or there's changing winds and, you know, somehow CFI is going to rise from the ashes somehow? Um, or do you think that DeFi, you know, it's going to be DeFi decade, not just DeFi 2021 summer, or 2020 summer, 2022 summer. Is it going to be the DeFi century? Uh, so my view here is that I agree with the latter part is that I think DeFi is going to increasingly become more and more important, although, you know, it's obviously worth acknowledging that DeFi was very hot in 2021 and there's been a kind of secular decline in, uh, or sorry, in 2020 and then in the early part of 2021 and then later part of 2021, there was kind of a, a secular decline in, in, in demand for DeFi assets. And, um, you know, we haven't seen the kind of growth in trading volumes, in TVL, in, um, in borrow lending volume that one might have liked to see uh, if, the, if the DeFi uh, growth was really going to be meteoric from where it is today. So th I think it's a lot of the reason why the DeFi market broadly has cooled. But long term, I'm incredibly bullish on DeFi. I think DeFi is going to continue to grow and is a showcase of one of the most valuable parts of what crypto enables, which is permissionless innovation and composability across um, you know, different tools that any entrepreneur can pick up and, and build together to create something new. Um, now, that being said, on the question of CeFi investing, like why haven't we seen more CFI investments happen, especially over 2021. You know, the primary investments that took place in CFI were basically FTX. Was, you know, almost everything that got funded in, in 2021 was FTX. And um, I think there, there's a couple reasons why we've seen that. I mean, the reality, of course, today is that the largest companies in the world in crypto are all CFI companies. The two things that I think will always change that. One is you should never underestimate the ability of great entrepreneurs to find a wedge and use it to open up a market that wasn't obvious to the players there, right? So Binance became Binance 
by finding a strategy that other people didn't realize, which was leaning very heavily into ICOs and, and the growth of you know, other kinds of tokens. Obviously, FTX did the same thing. They appeared out of nowhere. There wasn't even a real gap in the market. And they managed to, out of sheer execution, build themselves a platform that ended up becoming very successful. And um, so one, you shouldn't discount the ability for entrepreneurs, especially folks who really are dedicated and operationally uh, capable to find a wedge to build their way into the market. And the second thing that you shouldn't underestimate is regulation. Because regulation is the one thing that can always shift the tectonic plates that we're all working on top of, right? And so right now, Binance, obviously, by far the largest exchange in the world, has something like 70% global market share in crypto. Massive, massive, massive uh, market share. You know, they're the equivalent of like the Google in our space. Um, but of course, they are on the back foot with respect to regulation. And you never know what can happen within a year or two. Samia, do any of your institutional uh, funds worry about regulation? Yeah, definitely. It is, it is something that is, um, that is uh, often brought up and it's a very important uh, element for, for this space. I mean, definitely there is, uh, there is uh, you know, still a long way to go on the regulation. I think we have seen over the last uh, uh, quarter a number of uh, positive trends uh, around that and I think some of the governments are starting to think about that. But also regulation is, in my view, what will enable the adoption. You know, I think um, some people are still not willing to jump fully into blockchain or crypto because of the lack of regulation and they are not, they're, they're unsure what, what it means for them and what are their rights or, uh, you know, guarantees or protections. And that, that's what, uh, you know, I see, I, I see it also as an enabler once regulation comes in and gives more clarity. It might push also more innovation in DeFi and more innovation around other use cases. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us on the panel today. It was extremely interesting hearing the different takes on the venture capital side of the blockchain industry. And from all of us at, at Cointelegraph Research, thank you for watching. We look forward to presenting you with another great panel very soon.